good afternoon. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, there we go. We'll get started here. We're going to talk about making and maker movement. Uh, but my talk really expect me to be talking about drones and 3D printing, but we're going to start almost back to the future and start with popular science. These magazines uh, started originally in, in 1872. Uh, originally they were more like what we think of as science journalism. We'll explain complicated science to the public. Uh, and that actually didn't succeed for them. They failed and they got started again. And then they figured out something a little bit different. Um, you know, if you see here, he rides a kite. Um, I don't know what science that really is on skis and, and uh, wings, um, but flying has something to do with a lot of the things. See the car pulling that? You know, and uh, you know, there's just some really interesting things. There's a great story about a young man in, in Grinnell, Iowa, who reads popular science, and he has two brothers, and they have free time, and they go decide to build this, you know, to see if they can get this kite up in the air. And they try to drag it behind a car like they're shown in the picture, and they nearly kill themselves. Uh, they jump off the barn to see if that would work, and, and uh, you know, eventually get somewhere to, to go with that. That young man uh, turned out to be Robert Noyce. He's the founder of Intel and probably the father of the Silicon Valley. And, and yet his youth started in this way of experimenting, playing, taking ideas, taking projects, and saying, I read about it, now can I do this? Can we do this? This sounds like fun. Popular Science evolved really to be this hobbyist magazine you know, for people that wanted to know something about science, but if you look at the, the words at the bottom, new inventions, mechanics, money-making ideas, we'd call that entrepreneurialism today, home workshop plans and hints, you know, um, it, it was not about science. It was about you. And that's a pretty big shift. It's like what you get to do. Magazines like Popular Mechanics this is 1944. Most of these I found after I started the magazine. But they were really invitations to do stuff. I love this. Christmas fun with electronic robots. Right? And they're doing the tree for you somehow. Right? Um, and, uh, you know, they always sort of balance the kind of futurism with uh, sort of practical information. Now, this one actually starts to get serious. This is Popular Electronics, and it's January 1975, and it announces the first mini computer kit, the Altair 8800. Well, two young men go to the Harvard newsstand, see this issue, and they decide to drop out of Harvard and go to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they want to write software for the Altair, and the company that started Altair lives, is based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It happened to be Bill Gates and Paul Allen, by the way. And these were people who wanted to just do stuff, and they, these magazines kind of did that for them. On the West Coast, we had a whole other group, you know, come out of the Homebrew Computer Club. This is the first Apple computer. It's pretty raw. It's made out of wood. It's hand-carved. It's using, you know, a, a receptacle and, and keys from other uh, things around the house. But this is often when we see makers, we're not looking at the iPhone in your pocket. We're looking at this, something very early, something like the first prototype. I started Make Magazine about 11 years ago because I felt that there was this, I, I just thought something was happening, and I, I kind of explained this way, was um, people were hacking software, and I thought they would begin to hack the physical world in the same way. In other words, I should be able to change the physical world the way I can change software environments. And I, I also thought that, like those old magazines, it wants to be fun. It wants to be something we get to do with technology, not just about buying technology. And this was our first issue, and this project has caught my imagination. It's kite aerial photography. And you build a rig, and this one's built out of popsicle sticks. And you hang it from a kite, and this is a disposable camera that takes really one picture. 
And when it's done taking the picture, the ping pong ball drops, and that's how you know it's taking the picture. You have about 90 seconds to get it up in the air and take the picture. The man that's kind of in, 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 on, the pic, on the cover here was a Chris Benton. He was a professor of architecture at University of California, Berkeley. He wanted to see buildings from different heights. You know, if you're in a plane, you're looking straight down on the ground, you're pretty low and looking straight up. He wanted to see them from different angles. And that's how he got into this, uh, almost to solve a practical problem, and he discovered there was an online community of kite aerial photographers. It actually goes back, you know, there's a great picture of the 1906, of San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake that's taken with a kite aerial photography rig. But he also begins to do it as an art form. He begins to enjoy not just the technology, but the results. And Chris is kind of near where that pink table is. And you can kind of see the line, black line coming out near the top. And this is along the California coast. And he began to do a systematic like kite aerial photography mapping of the coast. And he actually published a book called Saltscapes of some of the low, uh, South Bay. But in that first issue, I kind of said, you know, uh, we're makers. In effect, um, we're not just consumers of technology, we make things. And that was kind of the call, that was kind of the idea I originally had. Did I know where this would go? Of course not. But what really struck me is when I talked to people about this idea, they shut me up pretty quickly because they began talking about what they do or someone else they knew who was a maker. Again, we didn't have necessarily apply that word to them. That you should meet so and so. You should see this project. And I knew that something uh, was there. And again, we published on the right these kind of projects. And look at Popular Mechanics in 1961. You know, um, build this sidewalk car for your kids. Uh, I don't. I don't know what Scientist on the Brink of Hell is, but it's pretty interesting, right? <laughs> um, make your own printed circuits, and I. Again, I, I found this after we had published for a while, and this was the make your own printed circuits. And I want you to listen to the voice, the tone of this, because this is what really matters. Would you like to do this? Would you like to make your own printed electronic circuit from the base material of finished product? Process is easy, and readily obtained materials make this fascinating hobby available to almost anyone. Now, most people would think this is kind of hard, but this is the attitude of this magazine, that it's possible and, and accessible. I went back, we actually published the, the same kind of article, independently. And look at our language. Making your own printed circuit board might seem like a daunting task, but once you master the steps, it's easy to attain professional-looking results. And the process actually hadn't changed from the 60s. Um, this kind of etching could be done using the same materials, chemical process, uh, today. But not many people knew a lot about it. Makers, I... What really appealed to me was that they were enthusiasts. And, you know, making is, is a mindset and a tool set. And enthusiasts, I, you know, they're, they're mostly amateurs. They love what they're doing. They, they, in a sense, grow a community around their projects. When you become a maker, it's, you're working and talking about a project. You know, an example is, you know, if you want to go to Burning Man, you better have a bike that lights up, a glow bike, right? Well, how do you do that? Now, you might see that in a photograph and say, that's cool, but I wanted to show you, you know, the instructions for how to make that, take that um, electroluminescent wire, L-wire, how to use copper tape, how to bend it, how to uh, melt it a little bit so that it, it would go around your bike. And this is kind of the core of rebuilding um, the vocabulary of how to make things. But I think the core that I try to get at is that makers were playing. They didn't necessarily want to start a business. They didn't necessarily want to do it. They just enjoyed this. And that was the initial state. And I kind of realized that a lot of people that I saw, you might call them innovators. And we use that big word innovation, but I kind of wondered, where does that come from? What's before innovation? What happens before we think of ourselves as innovators or entrepreneurs? And I think we just start playing without actually knowing where we're going, why we're doing, but we're immersing ourselves in something that's really valuable and it's how we learn. Surprisingly, it's also how kids learn. So we started Maker Fair uh, about 10 years. To, uh, this May will be our 10th anniversary in the Bay Area. And it's just crazy fun. 
Um, these are things, some of those have been a burning man, uh, fire-breathing dragons, um, you know, electric cupcakes. <laughs> Don't you want one, really? Um, but this is what means a lot to me. You know, a father and a daughter, uh, a family sitting down and doing something together and enjoying it. You know, and mostly just seeing the, uh, the expressions on the faces of people that we, it, we really like to make things. And this young girl discovering that 3D printers could be used to make dollhouse furniture. How cool. So what I believe we're doing with Maker Faire is, is actually encouraging people to see themselves once again as producers, not just consumers. And to believe that that matters. Um, uh, not just to, to their own lives, but really to the future. Uh, last year we had 131 Maker Faires around the world. Um, about three quarters of a million people went to a Maker Faire. Um, I went to about 20 of them, and it seemed like, but you know, started in Oslo, Norway, and ended in Tokyo, Japan for me. Um, it is really amazing how uh, it, it's, it's growing. We only managed a couple of them. One of the insights we had is we can't get Maker Faire all the places it needs to be, so let's find ways that the community can self-organize a Maker Faire. There's one in Charlottesville. There's one at one of the schools here. So the maker movement, I believe, is changing how we make things, new tools for doing that. It's changing where we make things. We can make things here in our community that we might have bought from China in the past. It changes what we make. We can make one of a thing, a customizable thing. We can make shoes that actually fit our feet. Um, uh, all kinds of prosthetics and other things are coming from these new processes. But what excites me the most is it's changing who gets to make things. It means that you get to do something that you couldn't have done 10 years ago. And I think that that is, is part of this sort of democratizing force here of opening um, a, a whole new field to all kinds of people. And I think it's behind and part of a, a shift, a value shift, if you will, in our culture. A valuing, you know, what can you do? Your skills, not just how much money you have. Building over buying. Um, creation over consumption. In learning, I believe this is really important, a, a shift from informal learning to formal learning. That we learn a lot, we learn really well on our own when we're properly motivated, when we want to do something. Why don't schools take advantage of that? Um, you know, there's information everywhere. It's absolutely easy to find information. What's hard is to create an experience, have a context in which that information makes sense. And I think the most important thing, especially talking to students, talking to everybody, there is a new kind of freedom to make things. And I don't know whether you're an artist or an engineer or anything in between. You could take advantage of this to do things and take ideas that you've had and that you might not have acted on in the past and do something, make them real. So I want to tell you, it's a Joey Hudy went to the White House. And Joey uh, was 13 at the time, and he brought his project, an extreme marshmallow cannon. And, you know, it's kind of a funny divide, because here's traditional school over here, science fair projects with posters. Here's Joey with a extreme marshmallow cannon, and the Secret Service says, young man, there's no way you shoot this off in the, in the White House today. President comes by and says, does it work? Joey says, yes, it works, I'll show you. President pumps the uh, pressure, and you know you can see that expression on his face. <laughs> but Joey is also a little entrepreneur. When the president started to leave, he said, let me give you my card. <laughs> and on his card, it said this, don't be bored, make something. And the president actually like at a conference of governors a week later, use that phrase. And there's something really fundamental in consumer culture that we're bored. And we need to do stuff to get out of that boredom. And when I heard Joey say that, I realized that one of my motivations for doing make was, you know, it's almost like a lifelong battle to overcome boredom. When I was ki a kid, I was sick. I was bedridden I was in hospitals a lot. I was by myself. And I had to figure out strategies for not being bored. You know, I built models or I did puzzles, but I mostly found books. 
And I knew at a certain point that I did not have to be bored. And that sort of opens things for you in wonderful ways. Now, this was a man who I think was never bored. And I had a chance to visit Monticello uh, yesterday. And I have to say, he was a hero of mine growing up. And I probably have never, you know, coming here makes me say this. I, you know, admired, uh, he's really a touchstone, I think, for makers. Uh, his attitude, he's a thinker, he's a doer. He wants, you know, you look over the whole area and he's got, he, you know, textiles and, and uh, a forge. And he's trying to figure out how to almost be self-sufficient in doing all this. And I don't think I've ever admitted this in public, but I always wanted to be a gentleman farmer, and, and I am. I mean, these are my sheep in Northern California. Um, we make wine, um, and uh, this is my hot sauce. It comes from Fresno chilies I grow in the yard. But I find this terribly satisfying. Um, you know, how to do something I don't know how to do, and um, I'm not necessarily particularly good at, but it turns out the hot sauce is pretty good and the wine's pretty good, so I enjoy it. Now, this is also how I knew Jefferson was a maker. You've probably seen this because you all are from this, but, and I think, you know, this is the so-called polygraph. But what fascinated me, and I looked it up because the tour guide said, you know, he was, there were 50 of these made, and he was one of the early adopters in his day. He loved it. He wrote 20,000 letters in his lifetime, so this allowed him to copy those letters. He thought it was the most marvelous communication tool of his day. But what makes him a maker isn't that he built it or invented it, but he wrote to the inventors and saying, it could be improved, you know. <laughs> you know, this part doesn't work as well as it could. That's how we should think. The world can be improved. It can be made better. And Monticello is full of that, of just trying things and seeing what works. I want to, uh, uh, come on out, uh, James. I went to the Albemarle County Schools, which I think if you don't know, you guys are leading the way of bringing making into education here. You're doing a tremendous job of integrating, you know, um, inter, uh, integrated interdisciplinary and interactive learning. And I, I went to Robbie Munson's class on the right. He's a science teacher. Came up with this great idea. He's not just teaching because he's coming up with his own ideas. He said, I'm going to go to the Smithsonian Archives and find things that were invented a long time ago, and we're going to replicate them and get kids to make them in the classroom. And so this is what they're making on the left. And I saw all these kids doing it. This wasn't just they did one. Um, this is it. It is a page motor. And we're going to see if it works here. There we go. Now, it's pretty cool. That's 3D printed. That's laser cut acrylic. This is hand, -ripe, hand wrapped wire. Um, this is James Rudder. And he's from the um, laboratory school at, uh, of advanced manufacturing at UVA. And Glenn Bull, Glenn is somewhere out there, um, has been part of this. But Robbie's initiated this, and then he started working with the Smithsonian and with UVA to get this going. Now, that motor, the design for it, was patented in 1840. And the idea is when you go back in time, you can actually see how things were built and how they worked. And the kids get a better understanding of motors by going back that far. And they're actually asked to interpret how this could be made better. And, you know, I'm sure all of you know how this works, but it's just turning on and off the electricity. The contacts are alternating with a mechanical thing that's swinging around here so that different sides of this get current and that thing goes back and forth. And that's how we get that motor uh, to run. And it's, it's simple, but this is what hands-on learning should be, and it's a, a fantastic idea. Now, they didn't buy a kit either. This is made in their class. All the parts are made in the class. That's a clothes hanger right there. And the, all these little connectors are 3D printed. So don't think of 3D printing as just pushing a button and getting a finished thing. Think of 3D printing as making the parts to make something really cool. Thank you, James. So. So when I think of Jefferson, I think of people like Robbie. He's a Jefferson. I met, you know, uh, Gabby on the left. She's wearing, you know, her own wearable that she made with a flora badge, kind of Arduino. And uh, Beth is a teacher there who loves Legos and teaches kids in fourth grade how to solve word problems, how to break them down and build a Lego platform that explains the word problem so they can visualize it and understand what they're talking about. This is young Nick uh, Anglin, who I saw. He 
he is a pitcher in baseball, and he wanted to know whether his pitches were going in the strike zone. And he didn't have an umpire and everything else to do that. So he, using lasers and Arduino and photoresistors, built a grid uh, you know, of lasers pointing across. So when the ball breaks into that grid, it tells you whether it's a, a, a ball or a strike. And lights, it lights up. So I forget, he's like a sixth grader. Right? He comes up with this idea, and he's working on it. And boy, is he proud of himself. Um, and these are three more Jeffersons, right? This is Andy and Stephanie and Chad, you know, who, who they're leaders in this education system, along with Pam Moran. And they really have a fantastic culture uh, of, of making and creating. The kids are, uh, they're not all doing the same thing. They're in different groups. They have different projects. Not just in one room, not just in a makerspace which I'm glad to have makerspaces, but the, the whole idea is spread out through the school. So this is really, to, to, you guys got something here that's really special and is something that I'm hoping we can copy in, in school districts around the country. You have another Jefferson, and this is uh, Brian, who runs Tinkersmith's makerspace. If you haven't been down there, this gives you access to all these tools, right? And it's actually free, can you believe that? He's figured out that it supports his business by helping bring talent in there that he can use in other ways. But it's a great art space, kind of influenced by Burning Man and Maker. And uh, I just think what, what they're doing there is really special, and it was just uh, uh, really great to meet them. But it's just like in Jefferson uh, Monticello, you have all those different areas where they made stuff. And here in this maker space, you have you know, your woodworking, you have a CNC machine and a 3D printer, and you get to do all of that there. So uh, there's a website, uh, you, know, you know, Defining Maker, and it's really active and, and, and wonderful. You know, one of the really great things about making today is people are, are getting together. This do-it-yourself becomes something that's very social, and you learn from each other and share with each other. And I think the most important thing that's been created in the maker movement really is this sense of community. And you have a local community of makers that you can tap into. And that's, that's really, really important to you. Um, you meet other people, and that's what Maker Faire is designed to do, is to flush those folks out who work, you know, just privately in their kitchen or garage and get them to share uh, uh, with other people. So you have local communities and you have communities of interest online and, and all over. So the big question I have for you is, are you a maker? If you are, raise your hand. Okay, now I'm biased in this, so you know, I want you to say yes, if it's not clear. I want you to believe you're a maker, even if, ah, who cares if your dad didn't tinker, you know? Who cares if you didn't? But if you cook, if you garden, if you knit, if you have ideas in your head that are just waiting to come out and be written down or painted or, or shaped into something, you are a maker. So join us, participate, get involved, and share the wonderful things you do with the people around you. Thank you very much.